Hello everyone. In a previous video, I talked about uh, the conditions for which a massive star uh, collapses into a black hole. And one of the key contributors to that result was J. Robert Oppenheimer. And since a lot of people have been talking about the recent movie Oppenheimer, I thought it would be interesting to talk about uh, his contribution to the Manhattan Project and some other key discoveries that led to the development of nuclear weapons. Um, as a disclaimer, I am not an expert in nuclear physics. I have done some work in elementary particle physics, um, but those are looking at subatomic particles like um, leptons and uh, quarks and etc. But um, in this case, we are looking at um, atomic structures and uh, and nuclei. So I I I would not consider myself any kind of expert in this field. So if I do make a mistake, uh, please correct me, and uh, I will I will do my best to make corrections in in the comments and 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 the description. So let's go. Uh, first, I will talk about some of Oppenheimer's achievements and his contributions to the Manhattan Project. And then I will talk about a key timeline of discoveries that led to the development of nuclear fission and subsequently the the, um, the atom bomb and um, eventually the collaborative effort of the Manhattan Project. And these key discoveries come in two categories. First, the, um, the discoveries that motivated um, nuclear fission. And secondly, the uh, principal and um, principles and applications of nuclear fission. So let us first talk about uh, let us talk about Oppenheimer's achievements. So Julius Robert Oppenheimer is credited to be the father of the atomic bomb. Uh, this is simply because he was direct the, the director of the Manhattan Project and he performed the first fast neutron calculations. Additionally, he motivated the implosion type fission reaction, which was the basis behind the Trinity project, excuse me, and the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki, which is named uh, Fat Man, and was dropped on August 9th, 1945. However, in my opinion, there are many other central contributors that don't get enough credit to the development of the atomic weapon. Um, but this is not to undermine Oppenheimer's achievements in any way. He has made many, many discoveries in physics that are quintessential. So firstly, he talked. He does. He theorized cosmic rays. He theorized the um, artificial radioactivity of deuterons. He predicted the positron after Dirac wrote down his Dirac equation, and he derived the lower mass limit of black holes, which I talked about in the previous video. Additionally, with regards to the Manhattan Project and any scientific uh, and any scientific collaboration that is um, that has many many people. It is important to have a good leader. So Oppenheimer's achievements are definite, are definite, uh, are definitely amazing, and they and his uh, recognition is well deserved. But I will talk about some of the other key contributors to the Manhattan Project. Uh, here are a timeline of the discoveries I think are important. So first are the um, are the discoveries that motivated the um, the nuclear um, Basically, the discoveries that motivate a nuclear fission. So, uh, firstly, it was the discovery of radioactivity by Henry Becquerel and Pierre and Marie Curie. And then there was Einstein's uh, mass energy equivalence, the most famous equation. Even children know this equation, E equals MC squared. Uh, then there's the discovery of nuclear transmutation by Ernest Rutherford. Then, uh, kind of an experiment to support Rutherford was done by uh, Ernest Walton and John Cox. Croft, who developed, who kind of uh, demonstrated that the atom can actually split into two. Afterwards, uh, we need to talk about uh, a key discovery by James Chadwick, who discovered the neutron. And th for those who know what nuclear fission is, the neutron is a central uh, particle to induce nuclear fission. But then I'm going to talk about the principles and applications of nuclear fission. So basically, uh, after nuclear fission was kind of um, um, after the science behind nuclear fission was kind of developed, there was the a hypothesis of a chain reaction. Then there was the discovery of the the first um, observation of nuclear fission by uh, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. Uh, but 
in this in their discovery, they did not really believe in their results because they thought that it was impossible that that um neutrons could split the atom. But then Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch um showed uh, basically use uh, theory and mathematics to show that their results are entirely po possible. And then um, to further support that their that their discoveries are not just a fluke, uh, Leo Zillard and Enrico Fermi uh, developed the first controlled nuclear reactor. And afterwards, uh, not many years afterwards, the Manhattan Project came about and they developed three nuclear bombs, I guess. The first one was Trinity. Secondly, the one dropped on Hiroshima in, on August 6th, 1945, was Little Boy. And finally, Fat Man, the one dropped on Nagasaki. So let us first talk about uh, this discovery of radioactivity by Henry Becquerel. So uh, Henry Becquerel um, actually made this discovery by accident. He placed a kind of a photographic plane uh, on top of a uranium salt sample. And what he realized that was that in the exposure of this, um, in the vicinity of this uranium salt, the plate actually blackened. And he knew that the plate would only blacken if it was exposed to some kind of radiation. And he initially thought that this was a mistake, and he thought that uranium salt could not have been doing this. So he placed this, um, this pho uh, photographic plate uh, elsewhere. And he found that only within the vicinity of this uranium salt, there was this blackening that occurred. And uh, then he, he noted down this discovery, and then he was credited for the discovery, for the qualitative discovery of um, um, radiation. But the problem is his initial hypothesis was incorrect, because uranium salts are compounds which contain other things um, other elements other than uranium. And he hypothesized that it was the other elements that were interacting with the uranium in a special way, such that they emitted this kind of radiation. And at that time, with, with the benefit of hindsight now, we know that that is not true. But at that time, it was a reasonable conclusion. But then, uh, in the same year, uh, Marie Curie was um, very interested in this kind of discovery, and she was doing her thesis on uh, radioactivity. And her husband, Pierre, developed the first elect electrometer. And a little disclaimer again, I am not an experimentalist, I'm a theorist, so I don't know that much about apparatus and stuff. But I, I did a lot of research, and I guess I can give a satisfactory explanation of how an, an electrometer works. So basically, what happens is a radioactive sample is placed onto this uh, sample ionization chamber. And what happens is the the radioactive sample emits ionizing radiation that goes up here. And what happens is um, this ionizing radiation causes um, elect um, emits particles that have charge. And this uh, basically induces some kind of current. And by inducing this kind of current, it moves this mirror. Basically, it will attract or repel this mirror, um, either left or right. And what happens is this light uh, spot has a scale on it. So basically, by how much this light spot moves, we can deduce how much radiation is being emitted by the sample. And to be completely honest, I'm not entirely sure what this weight and piezo electro piezo electric crystal does. But to my knowledge is that it is used to recalibrate this um, device because the device is actually quite delicate if we want to measure the um, if we want to measure the amount of radiation. So uh, how this is an improvement on Becquerel's discovery. First of all, Becquerel's discovery is a qualitative one because he didn't actually have a way of quantifying how much uh, radiation was being emitted by this uranium salt. And here we have a more quantitative way. So we, we, can, quant we can quantify how much radiation is being emitted by the sample, but, the, but they actually improved upon Becquerel's hypothesis because they, they did this experiment with many different uranium salts. And, f and different uranium salts contain different kinds of elements, but what they will always contain is uranium. And what they found that as long as the salt, as long as the compound contains uranium, this, this, um, this radioactive effect was, was, uh, was seen. But not only, not, not only that, 
not only was it emitting radi um, ionizing radiation, um, approximate, um, about the same amount of ionizing radiation was um, measured for different compounds, but the same amount of that compound. So this kind of implies, um, basically, uh, Marie Curie hypothesized that it was not the interaction between the uranium and the other uh, elements in the compound, but she said that it was an intrinsic property of the atom itself. And she kind of hinted at the possibility that the atom is not indivisible and it was giving off this um, particles from the atom itself. So this was kind of a, a, a key discovery because it was always thought that the atom cannot be split because the word atom is actually derived I think it's Greek. I'm not sure. I think it's Greek from the word indivisible. So that's why this is a key, key discovery. But then about nine years later, Einstein had kind of a more mathematical way of describing why, what, what, uh, why particles can do this. It is, um, sorry, okay, so basically in 1905, Albert Einstein developed his theory of relativity which states that physical quantities are reference frame dependent. And he showed that assuming that the speed of light and the laws of physics are constant in all reference frames, then physical quantities like position and time in a, in a moving reference frame must be different to that of a stationary reference frame. So he showed that the uh, time t prime and the position x prime in an inertial frame moving at velocity v must transform as follows where gamma is called the gamma factor or the Lorentz factor, which is equal to one over square root of one minus V squared. There should be a um, V squared over C squared here, but here I'm using natural units because um, the math is simpler. And later when we derive the, but what, later when we derive the energy relation, I will put these factors of C squared to make the, to make the relations more appear, uh, apparent. And X and T here are the position and time in the rest frame. So basically if I'm standing still, I measure um, position and time exactly the same. So what does this mean? Uh, from the Lorentz transformation, if we take an infinitesimal element of the time in the rest frame and the space in the rest frame and the time in the moving frame and the time and the space in the moving frame, we find that this quantity called the interval is invariant. So minus dt squared plus dx squared in the in the rest frame is exactly the same as minus dt prime squared plus dx prime squared in the moving frame. So this means that the interval, this implies that the interval is invariant under Lorentz transformation. However, uh, a lot of people actually, when I was doing special relativity in undergraduate, maybe you know, one or two, they a lot of times they say, oh, given the Lorentz transformation, prove that the, um, prove that the interval is invariant. Yeah, sure, this exercise is just a proof of concept. But I think it kind of gives the wrong impression because it kind of says that it kind of implies that the Lorentz transformation is more fundamental than the than the invariance of the interval. And this is simply not the case because to derive Lorentz transformations, uh, you need to assume that the interval is invariant. But then again, when I read a lot of relativity books and they derive the Lorentz transformation using the interval, using the interval, um, they do not explicitly show why the interval is invariant under Lorentz transformations. So first I will talk about why it is invar invariant. So uh, because Lorentz, uh, the, the interval can, um, the invariance of the interval at least, can be derived from the postulates of special relativity. There is a more mathematically rigorous proof that uses bilinear transformations, but the proof is actually quite tedious. And um, instead, in this video, I will offer some more physical motivation as to why that, as to why the interval is invariant in all inertial reference frames. To illustrate this, let a primed quantity denote the quantity in the moving frame, and an unprimed quantity denote a quantity in the rest frame. Now, consider a light pulse emitted at the origin, so at two different origins: origins O and O prime. So basically, this is O, let's say this is the origin. So this is the, the y-axis and this is the x-axis. And this is the, the um, O prime. This is the moving frame. So this is the rest frame and this is the moving frame. But at time equals zero, these two frames coincide. So basically, the origin here and the origin here coincide. 
But assuming that the speed of light is constant in both frames, the wave front is described by the interval. And we find that this interval is minus dt squared plus dx squared is equal to zero in the rest frame. But similarly, if we consider the wave front in the moving frame, we find that ds prime squared is equal to minus dt prime squared plus dx prime squared is equal to zero, which is the wave front in the s prime frame. So we can see that uh, since ds squared and ds prime squared are infinitesimals of the same order, this implies that ds squared and ds prime squared are proportional by some function. And in order to show that they are invariant, we need to show that this function is one. And to do this, uh, we need two more postulates of relativity. That is homogeneity and isotropy. So uh, I talked about homogeneity and isotropy in my cosmology lecture, and I math describe it more mathematically there. But here I will give a more physical, uh, a more physical argument as to what what these are. So homogeneity is basically a property where you cannot dis. So basically, if I put you on a on a um on some place in space time if i if i place you here and i place you elsewhere you cannot tell the difference between the two the two places and isotropy is if I, if you look in one direction and then i rotate you in another direction you cannot tell the difference between those two uh whether which direction you're looking at so homogeneity means that uh things should be position um the position sh um the maybe I, I should say it like homogeneity implies that uh, you should not be able to tell where you are in space-time and isotropy should be you should not be able to tell which direction you are in space-time so as a result it is clear that the proportionality function cannot be position dependent as this would violate homogeneity so if it was position dependent you could tell the difference where where you are in space-time and the the proportionality uh, function could be a, a function of velocity, or more specifically, the magnitude of the velocity. But it cannot depend on the direction of, of, the, of the velocity vector, because this would violate isotropy, as you would know. If, if it depended on the direction, you would know the difference um, if the function was dependent on. So basically, if the function was dependent on direction, and it, was, uh, it would change dependent on the, on the direction that it points. So you would be able to tell based. So basically, if you get the function and it changes in 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 another frame, you'd be able to tell which one is is the moving frame or the rest frame. So this violates uh, isotropy. So uh, a must be proportion. A must be a function of the uh, the magnitude of the velocity only. So uh, let us consider another reference frame S prime prime moving at velocity v prime prime as observed by s and capital B as observed by v prime. Then the, sorry, then the intervals are related as follows. So we have ds squared is equal to a of v prime uh, ds prime squared. ds squared is equal to a of v prime prime ds prime prime squared. And ds prime is equal to a of capital V ds prime prime squared. So what does this mean? We can divide 3.6 by 3.7, and we can divide 3.7 by 3.8, and we can find the following relation. And from this, we can observe that A of V is dependent on the angle between the vectors V, v prime and V prime prime, whereas A of V prime prime over A of V prime does not. Therefore, to, in order to satisfy the equations in 3.6, 3.8. A not only has to be a constant, but A has to be equal to 1. Hence, this, in, this proves the invariance of the interval in all reference frames. Um, and with this, we, we are one step closer to proving the mass energy equivalence. And I will talk, um, to be completely honest, when people derive the mass energy equivalence, I have, I originally wrote a, 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 a derivation uh, based on uh, using the definition of relativistic momentum and then uh, calculating the force and then integrating over the force to get the work done. But then I realized um, this proof is slightly 
incorrect because there are inconsistencies with the with the time in the moving frame and the time in the in the rest frame. So I abandoned that original derivation and um that original and that derivation is not how Einstein derived it. Actually, this way that I'm going to der derive it is also not the way Einstein derived it. Einstein derived it using another method where he considered he 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 had a thought experiment and he considered light, the energy of light emitted in different reference frames. And to be completely honest, um, I thought that proof was a little bit more complicated than it needed to be. Um, but Einstein did eventually correct, uh, not really correct, but he derived multiple versions of this proof. So he realized that his initial one was not so elegant. The way that I'm going to derive it is a little bit more advanced because it, it uses Lagrangian mechanics. But I think it's easier to see why the mass energy equivalence is, oh, well, the mass and energy are equivalent in in a way. So to begin with, uh, in order to derive the um, Lagrangian, we need to derive the action. And recall in Newtonian mechanics, the trajectory of a particle dis is described by the path that minimizes the action. But what is the action? So recall that the action is defined as the integral over the Lagrangian um, integrate. So it, it's basically the Lagrangian integrate over time, where the Lagrangian is the kinetic energy subtracted by the potential energy. Uh, but initially, uh, I, I mean, this is a def definition, right? But we, the motivation behind this, at, in, at least in Newtonian mechanics, is not very clear. Uh, but in special relativity, I think the action is actually more geometric and more intuitive because the interval describes the length of a space the length of a world line on the space-time diagram. So a world line is basically a line on the on the y-axis that is time and the x-axis that is space. So so basically, uh, this describes a line on on the space-time diagram, uh, which inherently actually describes the outline of um, describes the trajectory of the particle, and hence we can infer that the action must be proportional to the length of the world line. And from this inference, uh, we can guess a form of the action, namely this one, S equals K times the integral over the over the, um, the square root of the integral, basically, where K is some proportionality constant. Now, since we want the Lagrangian, we need to integrate the action as an, we need to write the action as an integral of time. So we this is quite simple, right? We can write the ds squared as minus dt squared plus dx squared, which is the definition of the of the interval. Then we can divide by dt squared, and then we take it outside of the square root. And dx over dt is simply the velocity, so we get v squared minus one. But um, looking at this, we actually encounter a problem because let us assume that k is a real number. Then the action, and by virtue, the Lagrangian must be an imaginary quantity. Since the velocity must always be less than one in 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 natural units, which is which means that the velocity is less than the speed of light in in special relativity, but uh, the Lagrangian should have units of energy since it is simply the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, and should not be an imaginary quantity because it is an observable quantity. Therefore, our initial guess of the action was wrong. But there are ways we can fix this, right? We can just, the simplest way is to just transform ds squared into minus ds squared in the square root. I mean, that's pretty trivial. Another more, I guess, I don't know, a more subtle way to do it is to perform a wick rotation of the time axis. And this is Hawking's favorite trick. He likes to do this a lot in Euclidean quantum gravity and stuff. So that is just to simply make the time imaginary. So we just set t um, to some quantity i tau. And looking at this expression, right, this quantity is imaginary. If we make mi one minus uh, v squared, and then we can just put i times i, and then they not really cancel out, but they multiply to make a, a real number. So this is completely fine. Uh, but then uh, I'm just going to use the simplest trick and just transform it as minus d squared in the, in the, uh, in the integral. So by doing this, we get one minus v squared, which is completely fine because v squared is always less than one. So this, this quantity will always be will always be real. And by doing this, we see that the the um, the integral is simply one over gamma. 
And this implies that the relativistic Lagrangian is one over gamma multiplied by K. And now the task at hand is to determine what this value of K is. And since um, L sub rel is supposedly the relativistic Lagrangian for a free particle, it stands to reason that in the non-relativistic limit, namely V is much less than one, the relativistic Lagrangian should reduce to the non-relativistic Lagrangian of a free particle, which is a half mv squared. So to do this, we perform a binomial expansion and we get this, right? So we can ignore the v to the four term because this is very, very small. And we keep the leading, the leading order terms. And what happens is we realize that in order to make the equation consistent with the non-relativistic limit, we just set k equals to minus m. However, we do notice that we do have an additional factor of, of minus m. And technically, the correct um, expression for the Lagrangian should be minus m 1 over gamma minus 1 uh, multiplied, sorry, minus m multiplied by 1 over gamma minus 1. Um, but however, uh, to be honest, it doesn't really matter because when we minimize the action, um, this term, um, the constant term does not contribute. So it, it, it really, it, it, it's kind of redundant to, be, to, to, to do this. But, uh, and then now we can actually derive the energy quantity because recall that the Hamiltonian is the total energy. So it's simply the, but um, to get the Hamiltonian from the Lagrangian, we simply multiply the conjugate, mo um, conjugate momentum times the velocity minus the Lagrangian. So we need to determine the conjugate momentum. But from Lagrangian mechanics, we know that the, Lagrange, um, the conjugate momentum is simply the partial derivative of the Lagrangian um, with respect to the velocity. So we find that um, the momentum is simply gamma mv. And we can see that uh, this is simply the relativistic momentum. So this is kind of a motivation as to why we've not only shown that um, so previously in other proofs, they assume that the the momentum is relativistic. But using the Lagrangian framework, we've actually shown that the um, the relativist uh, that the momentum must be relativistic. So by doing this, uh, we show that um, p v minus l is equal to this, and expanding it out, we get this is equal to gamma m. So the energy is equal to gamma m. But uh, this is in natural units. So let us convert back to SI units to make it more, I guess, dimensionally sound. So this would be E equals gamma MC squared, which is equal to uh, MC squared over square root of one minus V squared over C squared. This is the relativistic energy. So this is the energy uh, in a frame that is moving at velocity V. Uh, but we can, uh, but this is not, the equation that everybody knows, right? This is not E equals MC squared. But we can see this if we take uh, the energy in the rest frame, where we set V to zero, and one obtains the famous mass energy relation E equals MC squared. See, if we put V equals zero, this is one minus zero, and square root of one minus zero is just one, so we just get MC squared. So this is quite a nice, nice relation. So with this discovery, there are, so with the discovery of, uh, mass energy equivalence. There are other experimental discoveries that supports this. Um, but before we get to that, we need to talk about some um, intermediate discoveries. And the first of which is the discovery of nuclear transmutation by Ernest Rutherford. So Ernest Rutherford discovered that if a nitrogen atom is bombarded with alpha particles, it becomes an oxygen atom with a proton. So what happens is you can see this uh, this apparatus. Once again, I, I would like to say I don't do experiments, so I'm not certain of what happens. So uh, please forgive me if I make any mistakes. So as I know, nitrogen is going through here. The alpha particles are being bombarded here. What happens is we observe protons here and the radioactive source comes out here. So this is a zinc sulfide screen and this is a silver form. So we observe that the part, so this is zinc sulfide screen, I think lights up when the when the particles actually hit here. So we know these are uh, protons because the protons interact with the zinc sulfide screen to get um, to, uh, basically we, we know that these are protons. But I think the purpose of this radioactive source is to, uh, when, we, when we suck out the radioactive source, we see that we, we are getting oxygen instead of nitrogen. So this is the first, I guess, observation that elements can be transformed from one form to another by bombarding particles of them. 
So we, we see that this is the first kind of example of, of nuclear transmutation. But then uh, this is not, well, we can see, right? So basically, if I didn't actually put the proton number here, but uh, if you if you look at a periodic table, nitrogen is uh, one below. So nitrogen has seven protons and oxygen has eight. So this is an example of a something of lower atomic number being converted into something of higher atomic number, which is not really nuclear fission because nuclear fission is the splitting of atoms. But in this case, uh, this is we're getting closer to nuclear fission, but it's not really nuclear fission because nuclear fission is splitting a very heavy atom using um, a neutron. So in this case, we're only using we're in this case. Um, basically, I'll explain what the discovery is first. This is the first artificial um, case where we. No, this is the first experiment where we artificially um, split nuclei. So basically, what's happening here? Uh, basically, Cockcroft and Walton uh, bombarded protons at lithium at lithium atoms to produce two alpha particles. So maybe I should talk about what are oh alpha particles are basically helium nuclei. So there are helium atoms without electrons. So uh, lithium it has an atomic number of three. And proton, well, they have one proton, so it's atomic number of one. So by bombarding these, we get uh, two helium nuclei. So basically, one one lithium atom gets bombarded with a proton, and it splits into two um, alpha particles. So how this works is, um, I, again, I I'm not certain about the experimental details. What happens is this produces this chamber here is I think is an ionization chamber. So basically, there are hydrogen atoms here. And basically, the anode and cathode basically ionizes the hydrogen to make protons. And this proton is the, then sent down this uh, tube. And this tube is charged to uh, minus uh, 200,000 volts. And what happens is this accelerates the charge. And the accelerated protons uh, hit the lithium target. And what happens is that the fluorescent screen uh, detects the alpha particles. So, so basically, this is the first case of artificial nuclear splitting. And what happens is Cockcroft and Walton's discovery um, supports Rutherford's 1917 discovery and essentially uh, Curie's hypothesis that the atom is not indivisible. So Curie initially hypothesized, as mentioned before, she hypothesized that um, the uranium atom was actually giving off the radiation by um, splitting um, uh, protons and neutrons off its own nuclei. And this is kind of a support of that because we've shown that by bombarding uh, lithium atoms with protons, we can cause atoms to split like this. And furthermore, this, verify, um, this was the first verification of Einstein's mass energy equivalence because uh, basically what happens is you will find that in the before the reaction, something called the nuclear mass is much heavier than, not much heavier, but a little bit heavier than uh, the two alpha particles produce. But recall here, E equals mc squared. Even a little mass will make a difference because c squared, okay, so c is the exact number is 299792458 meters per second. So let's say three times 10 to the eight. So if you square that number, it's like nine times 10 to the 16 which is a very large number. So given a very small amount of um, mass, you can create a large amount of energy. So this is the consequence of, of Einstein's uh, mass energy relation. And it was experimentally supported by Cockcroft and Walton. And then uh, another key discovery is that um, James Chadwick discovered the neutron. So basically what happens is we can see that in the previous two reactions, right? We're producing things called protons, but I haven't actually. Okay, I did put the seventeen and the fourteen as neutron number. Um, this includes neutron numbers, right? But this is with the benefit of hindsight, so I know that um that neutron they have neutrons. So, but they they didn't know about neutrons back then, so they assumed that the mass was was due to just was protons and electrons. But here, Chadwick proved that the nucleus consisted of neutrally charged um, particles called neutrons. And how he did this was kind of, I think, ingenious because it, originally what happened was he was doing the experiment without this paraffin wax. 
And what happened is this alpha particle is bombarded into, so alpha particles, again, are helium nuclei. So they're bombarded into beryllium atoms and they produce carbon 12 and, um, and neutrons. But initially, uh, we didn't actually observe any neutron um, neutrons without this paraffin wax because basically the, the signals would get mixed with other things like protons and it was not very clear. But by adding the paraffin wax, what we can see is very interesting is because the paraffin wax is made of hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons are rich. Uh, hydrocarbons have a lot of hydrogen atoms and hydrogen atoms are essentially protons with electrons. So basically protons with electrons. So they're very rich in protons. So they provide a proton barrier. So what happens is when this um, unknown radiation comes towards us, like and it hits the paraffin wax, the protons get deflected. And what remains in the amplifier is the neutrons. And he observed that there was a particle that was neutrally charged, but had a similar mass to the proton being observed. So this was the discovery of the neutron. And this is quite an important discovery because later when we learn about nuclear fission, it is a it is a key result in the, in, in it's not, not a key result, but it's a key particle that induces nuclear fission. So uh, let us talk about uh, the chain reaction hypothesis. So uh, Leo Zilard basically hypothesized that uh, by after, uh, what's his name, Chadwick's discovery of the neutron, he hypothesized that you can use neutrons to make atoms uh, like, like in the proton case with, uh, with, uh, Cockcroft and Walton's discovery, they made atoms split using protons. But if you think about it, uh, this is actually far more difficult because the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. And what happens is the nucle if the nucleus is positively charged and you try to bombard it with another proton, which is positively charged, there is a repulsion. So if you've ever, it's, if you've ever, if you, if you ever put two, oh, well, it's not exactly the same, but, uh, the repulsion is similar to putting two of the same poles of a magnet together. So if you put two charges of the two of the similar same sign charges, they will repel each other. So basically, um, if you try to bombard a proton into a nucleus that is positively charged, then what happens is it is very difficult for that atom to split because you'd have to bombard that proton at very high energies. And, and to overcome the Coulomb repulsion between the nucleus and the and the incoming proton. So a Zillard kind of came, he was actually trained as a chemist. And in chemistry, we also know that there are chemical chain reactions. So he kind of used that motivation and he used the analogy of chemical chain reactions to, to motivate um, uh, nuclear chain reactions. And he tried to actually induce the first chain reaction, but he actually failed. Um, but then there were some people who were successful uh, this was, so basically the first nuclear reaction was done by Strauss, uh, I forgot his name actually, what's his name? Straussman and the other ones. The first nuclear reaction was, uh, uh, Hahn and Zau Straussman, sorry. So basically, uh, Hahn and Straussman, basically what they did was they bombarded a, a slow moving neutron into a uranium-235 atom. And they found that the products that were produced were um, barium and krypton. And what is interesting about this result is that they showed that a heavy atom can, like a heavy atom like um, uh, uranium can be split by a very light uh, particle, like a neutron. And initially what they thought was, oh, this result must be wrong because uh, this was not only a regular fission reaction, but the neutron was moving very, very slow. So they thought that there was results were wrong because um, it is impossible for a very low energy neutron to, to split a, a large atom like this. So they contacted Lisa Meitner and uh, they talked about the results. And Lisa Meitner and her nephew... Uh, Meitner and her nephew, or Fritsch, basically, uh, were the story was they were talking about it on a a uh, in the snow, 
and they did some back of the paper calculation. And Lisa Meitner had a, a kind of a brilliant idea. She decided to use Gamow's liquid drop model. So basically, I, I don't know if you've ever played with liquid drops before, but the motivation behind liquid drop model is this. So basically, if you have a liquid drop, it usually looks very spherical. But if you add tiny, tiny drops at the time, it starts to it starts to become a little bit more oblong. And once it becomes oblong, sometimes it splits. So this is kind of a similar principle with atoms. And uh, the math is actually quite complicated. And I, and I had to actually do a lot of research as to why this was the case. But the reasoning is actually really uh, interesting, as I will explain right now. So basically, um, in, in SI units, the binding energy is given by the following expression, where A is the atomic mass, Z is the atomic number, M sub P, M sub N, and M sub E are the masses of the proton, neutron, and electron, respectively. Now, the last term is called the semi-empirical mass and is uh, calculated by the, we the Weizsäcker formula. And the Weizsäcker formula is as follows, where it is A minus Z times this, so basically, we have terms with the mass of the mass of the neutron, mass of the proton, and mass of the electron. But but there are additional terms with um uh, that have powers of the atomic mass and some other coefficients. And these are correction coefficients. So uh, these and I'll explain each one. So the A B term is um fifteen point six seven mega electron volts per speed of light squared. Is basically this mega electron volts is so electron volts is the amount of energy to excite an electron to another. So, uh, so basically, uh, this is this mega means a million, so million electron volts divided by c squared. So, this is a unit of energy if we multiply by the speed of light. So, the volume is this the first one is a volume coefficient, so it takes into account the short range nuclear forces. Because the short, the reason why nuclear forces are short range is because of something called. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is the reason, but um, there's something called asymptotic freedom in in quantum chromodynamics, and uh, basically, as you go out further, the 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 forces between the the uh, the quarks become become weaker, and thus the nuclear the strong nuclear force at least has very uh, is very strong at short ranges, but is practically has a very short effective range. So basically, so at long ranges, it's practically nothing. So so this is um, the reason for the short range of the nuclear force. So then we have the A sub S, which is the surface coefficient. And this accounts for the nucleons at the surface of the, of the nucleus that surrounds this. So basically it accounts for that, that the nucleons at the surface of the nucleus are surrounded by fewer nucleons. So this effect is kind of um, kind of accounting for the density of of nucleons, and then there's another term called the Coulomb coefficient, uh, which accounts for the repulsive forces between the protons. As I mentioned before, if we use a proton to to um, bump, if we bombard a nucleus with a proton, it's kind of an ineffective because there's some repulsive force, and in this case, there is some repulsive force between the the protons and the nucleus, but we account for this term using this Coulomb coefficient. And finally, we have an asymmetry coefficient, uh, which is due to the Pauli exclusion principle. And we have a pairing coefficient, which makes the most difference, which is also a result of the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, so basically, this model explains why uranium-235 is fissile and uranium-238 is not. For example, uranium-235 has uh, 92 protons and has an atomic mass of 235. Therefore, delta here is zero because, uh, let's see, the, uh, the uh, what's it called? The atomic number is even, but the atomic uh, mass is odd. So this is zero. <laughs> On the other hand, for uranium 238, Z is equal to 92 and A is equal to 238. And thus A minus Z is 146. Thus, by using this rule, we find that uh, delta is delta is um, negative one eleven point two mega electron volts per speed of light squared. And thus, okay, to I will not do the full calculation because it is quite tedious. But assuming that the other terms do not make much difference to to m, 
we can see that the delta term drastically increases m for uranium-235. As a result, since there is a negative sign in front of m in the equation for E sub b, then the binding energy is significantly reduced. So basically, the binding energy is the amount of energy required for a fission reaction to proceed. And the physical reason behind this is because of Pauli's exclu exclusion principle that permits two, um, two fermions to occupy the same state. And any additional particles that occupy the state has to occupy it at higher energy levels. So hence, the asymmetry in number of protons and neutrons reduces the binding energy. Now, with this, there was the development of the first controlled nuclear reactor. And this was done by Zillard and Fermi. And they not, so basically how a chain, so Zillard was the one who um, came up with the, with, the, with the chain reaction. And how a chain reaction works is basically when a uranium-235 atom is uh, is is bombarded with a a a neutron. It produces barium and kry krypton. But what it does, it produces three more neutrons, and these three neutrons can interact with other uranium two thirty five atoms, and thus it will it will continue this reaction indefinitely if there are a lot of uranium two thirty five atoms. Not really indefinitely, but um, this reaction will continue in a chain. That's why it's called a chain reaction. And they not only devised um, the first controlled nuclear reactor, but they also devised a method to gauge the sustainability of a nuclear reaction. And this is through a quantity known as the criticality. criticality. The criticality is n i sub n uh, i sub so sorry n sub i plus one divided by n sub i, where n sub i is the number of neutrons generated in the ith state of fission. So the value of K tells us the sustainability of the fission reaction. So K less than one is subcritical, A equals one, a uh, K equals one is critical, and K less than one is supercritical. And subcriticality implies that the rate of neutrons that are being produced is decreasing with an increasing number of chain reactions. And this subcriticality means that the typically the re, um the chain reaction is not sustainable over a long period of time. And subcriticality is not really useless, but we can use them for proof of concepts in small experiments. And criticality, on the other hand, means that the rate of, at which neutrons are being produced is constant with an increasing number of chain reactions. So this reaction is good for um this criticality condition um is good for, I guess, reactions that you don't want to go out of control. So uh, actually nuclear power plants, when they they use this criticality condition and their criticality is typically 1.05. So it is close to the it is sub, um closer to the to the critical condition than any other. So this controlled nuclear reaction, I predict it is in the critical range because um, it is controlled and we don't want the nuclear reactor to go out of control. So basically, trage tragedies like the one in Fukushima or Chernobyl, um, basically the criticality um, exceeds one by a lot, and thus the reaction becomes uncontrolled. Uh, supercritic, and this is what happens when the, the reaction is supercritical. This means the rate at which neutrons are being produced is constant with an increasing number of... Uh, it's not constant. Sorry, this is this is not correct. Sorry, um, uh, sorry, the the neutrons that are being produced is increasing. They should be increasing with an increasing number of chain reactions. So, uh, when we want to develop nuclear weapons, we want the criticality to be much much greater than one. So we produce a lot of neutrons when we when we um when we do a when we perform a nuclear uh when we want to develop a nuclear weapon. So. This, with this, uh, shortly after, maybe three years after, we developed the atomic the atomic bomb. And the first one that was tested was Trinity, and it is not a gun-type fission reaction. So initially in the Manhattan Project, everybody was working on gun-type fission reactions. And um, Oppenheimer kind of opposed to this because he believed that gun-type fission reactions were not efficient. Um, I'll explain a little bit why later, but the first, he 
he kind of, but he was a little bit open-minded. He was like, oh, why don't we develop both of them and see which one phases better? And uh, how a gun-type fission reaction works is here we have a cylinder target and we have a gun barrel here and we have a uranium hollow bullet. So basically the neutrons, um, so basically this is a conventional explosive. So the neutrons, I, I'm not certain where it's being emitted, but I presume it's being emitted from the cylindrical target. So the distance that the neutrons have to travel is much greater in this case. And what happens is the neutrons, uh, with the greater distance the neutrons have to travel, the interaction with the uranium bullet is much lower. But when we want to detonate the explosive, we, um, the conventional explosive um, launches the uranium hollow bullet closer and closer to the cylinder target. And thus the interaction between the neutrons and the uranium bullet will be much, um, the, the probability of that occurring is much greater and thus the criticality will be much higher. So basically in this, so basically before the bomb detonates, we don't want the criticality to be very high. Otherwise it will explode and we cannot control the reaction. So um, before detonation, we want the um, criticality to be, to be subcritical. But when um, we want to detonate the bomb, we, um, we detonate this conventional explosive and then this uranium bullet will get closer to the cylindrical target and the reaction will be super critical. And what happens is the bomb will, will, will release a lot of energy in the form of radiation and we can calculate this energy using E equals MC squared. <laughs> but they also developed another type of explosion, um, another type of um, weapon called the um, implosion type fission reaction. And this was the basis behind, so this one, so the gun type one was the basis behind Little Boy. Whereas this one was the basis behind Fat Man and um, and the Trinity bomb. So basically, this was Oppenheimer's idea. So basically, what happens is instead of having an explosive from one end to another. So basically, this is just uh, a linear. Uh, so basically, the, the the neutrons will be going from one direction to another. Here, Oppenheimer proposed that we have explosives around the the atom bomb and concentrate the neutrons into the plutonium core. So uh, there's also another difference as to why. I, I, I guess I have no idea whether uranium or plutonium is a better, better mater uh, fissile material to, to use in nuclear weapons. But in this case, in, the, in Little Boy, they used uranium-235, and here they use um, plutonium-239. So a lot of people think that plutonium is a better um, candidate for developing atomic weapons, but I'm not sure if it's whether if, if it's the elements um, contribution or if it's the mechanism because the mechanism is completely different. So I, I actually think that Oppenheimer's idea is a little bit better because what happens is by by making explosions radially, basically spherically symmetric, you increase the probability of neutrons interacting with the plutonium core. And yes, um, this is basically the general gist of how nuclear weapons work. And I guess this led to the development of other web more powerful weapons. And Oppenheimer also did contribute to that. He he uh, he did work on calculations regarding um, deuterium and fusion type reactions. And if you don't know, a uh, fusion type reactions generate far more energy than fission type reactions. And these are called hydrogen bombs. And this is exactly why the sun shines so brightly in the sky because of fusion, because of nuclear fusion. And um, and uh, Edward Teller was is credited to be the father of the hydrogen bomb as they developed the hydrogen bomb during the Cold War during, um, between Russia and the United States. And they were competing to build more and more powerful bombs. And I think Russia eventually developed the Tsar bomb, which was immensely powerful. I I can't remember the exact power, but um, I think maybe those can can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the dam the damage can be um seen over a hundred kilometers. Is a hundred kilometers? I don't know. Um, many kilometers away at least. So so this is so uh. So the Tsar bomb was a very, very powerful bomb. But um, I guess the the key, uh, uh, the, the main message of this, this video is that uh, 
I there are many with the development of of um, nuclear weapons. There is many, uh, I guess, background scientists that has to be that has to be acknowledged because there are they made many many impressive discoveries that led to this to this um, to this to development of of the of the atom bomb and uh i hope you enjoyed this video because i i found it very interesting because i learned a lot about about this uh about this topic and i hope you did too and i'll see you in the next video